Welcome to the long-awaited Anglican Unscripted, episode 617. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today, September 4th, 2020. All right, before I reveal where I am, I'm going to have you guys participate in helping Anglican Unscripted become more infamous. No, famous. One of those two. And you do that by sharing the program. You do that by liking the program when you find it on Facebook and YouTube. You do that by going to the comment section and giving us your opinion. The shows don't stop when I click the unrecord button. It's not an unrecord button. When I stop the record button. It, the shows end when you stop commenting. So please go to the comment section, tell us what you think of the topics we're talking about, and the show can go on forever and ever. Eternity. Well, that's that's the nature of Anglican Unscripted. George, what you doing this week? Well, I'm going in to get some uh, surgery later today. I'm getting three, uh, what are they called, basal cell carcinomas out. Mm. And then next week I'm getting my... Uh, Bunion, uh, where the Ugh, well, whatever yes. it is, they're going to slice <laughs> open my foot. So this last week, I've been moving out of our storage unit, and so I've got to get all the heavy moving, all the heavy lifting, all the hard work done. Because for the next two weeks, I'm going to be a mess, be Frankenstein's monster with stitches and all that stuff. Yeah, you you don't want to pop a stitch moving uh, stuff out. And, and living in Florida, if you're over 55, you will get skin cancer. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> just right. Yeah, I know. It's just along with a little white dog. That is the two things that you get when you come to Florida: skin cancer and a little dog. Yeah. So every other doctor is a dermatologist. Then you go to your dentist, your dermatologist, and your, and your general practitioner. Um, let's move on to the news. But people want to go, oh, Kevin. Where are you? Uh, I've been traveling now. This is day 62 of our full-time RVing, and we find ourselves in Elkhart, Indiana. Why would anybody go to Elkhart, Indiana? Well, it's where most RVs are made. We know we're not here for service or warranty. We're here for the free parking on our way out to Pittsburgh. We are stopping here at the Elkhart, Indiana RV Hall of Fame. And yes, it's probably just a big tour stop, but they offered free overnight parking. And when you're a full time RV year and you don't want to pay 55 bucks a night for parking, you take every free shot you can. So we're going to go see the uh, the two hour uh, museum tour after I'm recording this show. And it, it, uh, it's like a timeshare that you get to stay for free, but you've got to do the two hour timeshare t- tour. I don't think they require it. But I don't want to. I don't want to be part of the RV or commuter community. And that oh, he's the guy who didn't come in after he stayed free. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want my license plate ending up on somebody's registry. I mean, there's places called Harvest Host and Boondockers Welcome and stuff like that where you can stay places for free. And what what's recently happened is the golf uh, club community has gotten on, and so they'll let you stay in at the golf course for free. But they knock on your door in the morning. Hey, would you like to join us for nine, right? <laughs> you know, nine holes? Oh, yeah, sure. That's why I stayed here last night. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you can play, say places for free. Jill and I have stayed uh, uh, many places for free. But if you want good, comfortable uh, camping, you find a, a nice cheap park for 20 bucks a night. And that's the, that's the way to do it. So we're on to Pittsburgh next week for Labor Day. We're going to visit the kids. And, yeah, uh, Kevin, what you yeah. should do is you should have all of our viewers send you a list of their churches, and that way you contact people say, do you mind if I park overnight in your church parking lot? And that way you'll have a network. And George, you could do, that, that, you could do promotional visits <laughs> and bring it all, bring it, have the road show. Sure. And do we have any viewers in Elkhart, Indiana, who would like to have Kevin over? Uh, well, actually, that's that's already been happening. I announced that we're heading south for um, the fall, and people from Georgia and uh, some uh, nice person from Savannah contacted me. A couple of people from Florida, probably Diocese of Central Florida. I haven't looked it up. Said yes, we can park in the church parking lot for free. So I want to thank the viewers for that. I'm not sure if we will do something like that or not, but when you offer something free to Kevin and Jill. We're bound to take you up on it. 
we're, we're not cheap, we're just inexpensive. That's the word we use. George, let's move on to the news. If people have not been paying attention for the last nine months, this is COVID times. And I don't know if anybody's paid attention to history, world history, church history, American history, but God has always used moments like this to willow out the church, to have a time where those who are not productive churches kind of die. And I think, George, from some of the stuff I've been reading, that is occurring big time. Uh, Barnum study. Did you get to, uh, uh, not the Barnum. It was Barna. Barna, sorry, Barnum. Oh my gosh. Barna uh, did a survey. 20%, 25% are going to fold within a, a couple months, George? Yes. Uh the Barna, Barna, which is a well-respected research foundation in the U.S. that looks at religion, estimates that 25% of churches are going to close their doors due to the COVID virus. Uh, and it was interesting going, sort of de taking a deep dive into the study. And what it said is that the trend, what has happened with COVID is that the trends have just been uh, just pushed together very rapidly. So a church that was on a 20 year uh, decline, losing one or 2% a year each year, uh, they're, they're going to take a massive hit and they may not be able to reopen because they'll have passed that critical point of active members and active income where they have to decide uh, we can no longer afford a full-time priest or we can't pay for this building or we have to heat a building up north that costs uh, so many thousands of dollars a week and we just can't do it with our income and so we're going to so the the barna foundation views uh as likely that we'll see a 20 we'll see a winnowing out um i saw another uh, story similar topic a man named tom rayner who has a very well re at least regarded by me well regarded website where a sort of clergy talk and pastor talk and things of that nature and there, he's saying that uh, the studies that they're seeing is that most churches are going to see a 25% drop in membership. Now, that's not average Sunday attendance, that's, but that's, membership. Uh, sure. So, in other words, the people that were always on your books and always sort of on the margins who may show up for Christmas and Easter, they figure they don't need, you know, they're going to they're, they're be gone. Uh, you've got people dying. You have people moving away. You have no really new blood coming in. And then you have people who have found that they like internet church. They like being able to sit in their easy chair with the dog on their lap eating popcorn. In their underwear. Have, <laughs> in your underwear. And they've found something with really slick production values and a good preacher, and boom, they're gone. So it's a very, so all of the trends of secularization that we've seen much, much faster in Europe may be hitting the United States. But at the same time, both Barna and Rayner say those who remain were probably going to be stronger in their faith, stronger in the church, because you're getting rid of sort of the, oh, the weak. Chaff. I don't, that, and that's it, a bad the, word. Okay, the, the biblical word is the chaff from the wheat. You're getting rid of the yes. chaff. Okay, so. So just like in an, it's the same thing we're seeing in the business world. The, the undercapitalized businesses, the mom and pop stores that can't compete with Amazon, can't compete with Walmart, they've been shut down in California for six months, they're never going to reopen uh, because the, uh, their business model is not going to work in the new world that we live in. Yeah, and that's at least for the, the short term, and when I say short term, two years, three years, the Amazon model works, the Walmart model works, the, the big uh, franchise works. Mom and Pops won't. Uh, we just saw this over the last five and ten years with bookstores. Bookstores were closing left and right because Amazon was there to deliver your books quickly. Uh, the video stores lost out to Netflix and lots of Kevin. business. Yeah. You've got to visit Bend, Oregon. Bend, Oregon. Okay. You know why? The oh, last family. blockbuster yeah. video mm -hmm. open to the public where you can rent videos is in Bend, Oregon. It, it's, it, 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 it'll be a memorable time for you and Jill all the way out <laughs> to Eastern Oregon. Well, I mean, and so 
those who can adapt their businesses and those who can adapt their churches and those who can um, find new ways to be uh, productive in this time will do just fine. Uh, we as a species, as created uh, image bearers of God, have this ability to adapt to situations where we originally find it uncomfortable, and then, you know, this is actually works for me. And then you find yourself not just less than comfortable, but productive and uh, serving and worshiping the way you did before, but better. So We saw some studies from the Church of England, uh, the Diocese of Sodder and Man, which mm -hmm. is the Isle of Man in the uh, Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and Scotland mm -hmm. and England, right in the middle. Uh, 90,000 people live on the island, and the Diocese of Sodder and Man uh, is its own diocese. And they put out a study, let, the archdeacon of the diocese did a study on building, building utilization. They have 41 parishes or church buildings, plus another 20 church halls. And the three months, six months of no income from parishioners has just devastated them. Uh, unlike most Church of England dioceses, most Church of England dioceses only get 50% of their income from the parishioner. The rest of it comes from the church commissioners and church okay. trusts and various things. Mm -hmm. Sodder and Man gets 75% from its parishioners. My parish gets 100% from its parishioners. We have no trust funds. We live and die by what arrives in the plate and in the mail. No endowments from the 90s, huh? Yeah. No. Nope. Uh, Sodder and Man said, at best, we have five years. At very best. Because mo many of our churches have told us they can't pay their shares now. That we have all these buildings that we have to maintain, we have to heat. And essentially what he said, turn, 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 turning to business language, is that we have a misallocation of assets. We are real estate heavy, land heavy. And each of these buildings may have a congregation of 20, 25 people when we only need 10 buildings to have 250 people in them each. And that's what our competition. Uh, there's some evangelical independent churches that have you know, one building that have as many people, that have three, 400 people in it. And, they have their, and the other, other uh, point that we're mentioning is we have too much administrative overhead archdeacons and diocesan women's officer and diocesan minority affair officers and interfaith. In other words, it's the offices are really well staffed, but the income is drying up. And this diocese has to make the hard choice. What do we do with these properties? How do we turn these assets into the, the diocese of Sodder and Man is asking good questions. Are we an architectural heritage trust? Mm -hmm. Do we want to preserve these buildings that have history, that have graveyards, that have been here for 500 years? Or do we want to do the work of Jesus Christ? And right now we can't do both. Well, we either have to put our money in keeping the roof from leaking or youth ministry. You and, and I, do? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the roof. You and I have been to England many times. And I remember driving through rural England where you come upon these small little towns and there's probably 10, 15 houses and there's still a church mm -hmm. because they, they drew in from the, the, the rural areas to, to go to church. And they were the church was still open and maintained. This is like 10 years ago. This is, I don't know if it is now. And they were trying to maintain the building and the infrastructure and the roof and, the, and they had to maintain it because the town was buried there. Most of the town's people for the last you know, three, four, five hundred 500 years were buried there. And the church's, you know, function was to, to keep up with the funerals and baptisms. And that's part of the infrastructure problem they're having in England is they're not keeping up gospel oriented churches. They're keeping up infrastructure churches. One of the hardships facing rural England mm -hmm. is that in those little villages, the post office is closed, mm -hmm. the pub has closed, the shops have closed and because everybody can drive to the local Tesco's at the business park 20 miles away, but the Church of England still must maintain that parish. Um, and so that there are some clergy, uh, there's one fellow I know who has nine churches spread over the countryside in, I think it's in Norfolk, mm -hmm. 
wow. uh, where you know how do you how do, how can you develop past relationships with ten people here, ten people there, ten people there, ten people there, and each of these churches are five, six, six. It's not like Florida where if 90% of the churches could be wiped off the face of the earth and we'd better place architecturally speaking. It's not that there's intrinsic value in our buildings here because they're so new, but in England, this is part of their storied, you know, heritage. Sure. And so you've got one guy covering all these little villages and they're so close together, he can do it in his car. How do, how do, you, how do you thread that needle, if you will? Well, the, I, and I, I now, the, the press reports have been either glee, gleeful that ah ha ha look, the dotty old Church of England's dying, or ha 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 told you so they're not doing the what they should be doing. But I think we have to give them credit for saying yes, we admit that we have a problem. See, the Episcopal Church is famous for refusing to admit that it has a problem. But at least this diocese in the Irish Sea is saying, yes, here's our problem. How do we go forward to carry out Christ's mission, given the asset structure that we've inherited? Well, so many Episcopal churches here in America still have large endowments. So the churches that survive are the wheat in five years or those with large endowments. And, you know, that's what I see anyway. Well, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll be an Episcopalian. Yes and no. No, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> n there are very few, if any, churches in Florida that have large endowments no. or endowments yeah. of any sort. Maybe Bethesda by the Sea and Palm Beach, and maybe some of the cathedrals, some of the winter places with old money. But, you know, my church, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary, and we're on our third building. Uh, Fifty years ago, there was orange groves and cattle. That's all there was here. People have moved here. So there's no time uh, to build up a legacy of generations. And within, say, half hour drive, within our county, there are five Episcopal churches. Three, I'm pretty sure, are going to either have to be merged or uh, go under because the, they're, they lose membership to us because we have all the resources we have all the programs we have well it's we put on a good show um and so the poor little church with a part-time retired priest they they can't compete i hate to put it that way yeah and it's but, not really competition i mean you're not deliberately trying to steal membership i mean no but you can't tell people not to come at the right. same time and but we, we're not we're not going through their membership list saying hey come join us and that's that's the hard part of church in kind of the electronic age. You have the better sound system, you got the better music program, you you have, you can serve the children better. And listen, parents in their twenties and thirties are looking for a place where their kids can learn and be uh, brought up in the knowledge of God, and they will travel to do that. And and we have we 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 lose people to the. PCA church in town, mm -hmm. which has built its own church school and has invested heavily in youth work. And so if you move into this town and you've got five kids um, and you want the resources, well, you, you know where to go. Um, if you move into the town, you're retired um, or you're just starting off a family, well, we've got we're, we're good competition and we usually keep the people who come visit the first time because they, it clicks. But you know, we can't, we don't have the, we were built basically as an Elks Lodge with religious services. We have a beautiful kitchen with beautiful parish hall, no classrooms, no facilities whatsoever for anything other than eating and praying. And, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd hire a youth assistant, I'd build a building for Sunday Christian education. You know, I'd do all the. If we all had money, we could all do stuff. Yeah, that's right. But it's a mismatch of assets and the need in the community. And we're going to see. I think we're going to see a tremendous continued shakeout. Um, one of the, it, one of the things uh, that Mark uh, Mark Tooley from the IRD, Jeff Walton, who's one of our frequent uh, contributors, guests, yeah. Yeah. on contributor, 
works works with Mark at the IRD. Mark's the head of it. And one of the things he wrote is that with the Methodist schism coming up, there are going to be a lot of empty Methodist churches for sale. And this is sad for the Methodist church, but it's an also an opportunity for independent congregations, churches like yours, which are which is growing, to acquire a ready-made church property. Um, and maybe this is something the Church of England needs to look into. How can we advance the work of Christ if it's not necessarily the work of the Church of England? It is interesting, and I'm just saying this, I'm putting it out there, and I remember driving through Bridgeport about uh, eight or nine months ago, and this is Bridgeport, Connecticut, and there were about four or five empty churches. All the empty churches had the rainbow flag on the front saying we welcome everyone well everyone didn't come you know and they were empty buildings that needed fixing up my my thing is the independent churches gonna have to have some money to fix up some of these older churches the roofs are caving in they have water leaks in the windows you know the boiler needs to be replaced i mean the reason the church that's there can't fix it is because they don't have money the people moving in will ha have to have some type of uh, infrastructure money to uh, take on those projects. And a lot of them will just, hey, I'd rather build a brand new steel warehouse building somewhere and worship there. So well, we I have know. those churches in you Florida and they are ugly, <laughs> they are. I gotta tell you. They no, are ugly. I don't disagree, but you know, as far as the stewardship cost savings, that you, know, you save a lot of money by moving into a, a steel structure. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to shock you. Whoa. I'm going to shock you and just have you fall out of your chair. So have Jill right. stand by yep. with some right smelling here. salts. Go, yeah. I'm going to say something good about J uh, Justin Welby. Well, that's fine. He deserves some praise here and there. <laughs> yes, he does. Uh, Justin Welby has, uh, uh, well, I have been scornful at times for some of his public pronouncements with issues of the day. I feel that he sometimes confuses left liberal politics and takes the Guardian more seriously than the Bible. And that's unfair, it's unkind, but sometimes he just goes off. During the past month or two, Justin Welby has responded to the crises in the news, not by giving us an opinion, not by giving us platitude, but by posting biblical verses. Mm -hmm. And either he's on vacation and his staff is doing this, well, he's really begun to understand that the job of the archbishop is not to be another political player, but to offer sort of a deeper road, uh, deep, deeper way forward. And I think this switch to uh, a biblically centered uh, messaging campaign, um, I think is pretty, go pretty, uh, pretty good. Hopefully in this time, the COVID times, the church and the clergy will not be woke, but they will be woken. And I think we're seeing that with Justin Welby, I, I hope. Yeah. See, it's so difficult in these times not to come out looking like a fool, like the Episcopal Bishop of Milwaukee got all in on this Jacob uh, Blake uh, business. Mm -hmm. And now the dust is settled and all the films are out. Here is a uh, is a ra is an accused rapist with a felony warrant with children in the back seat and a knife who's resisting arrest has been tasered three times and is threatening to kill the cops and he gets shot. And you're holding this guy up as a martyr of the next Martin Luther King. Just wait and see. Wait until the dust settles. And so the Episcopal Bishop of Milwaukee just looks like the latest talking head on CNN, a total fool, rather than a religious or moral guide. Uh, you know, it's just one of, and Justin Welby has avoided this past month. Recently, yes. <laughs> Very recently he's gone from woke to awoken. So we, we shall see. Um, it's hard because it's very tempting to look at these videos and say, oh my gosh, I know what happened because I saw the video. I see what's happening, and everything is just in that 30 seconds, not knowing 
sadly that stuff happened before the video was recorded and stuff happened after the video was recorded and it, all you're looking at is a moment in time we don't judge moments in time we don't i'll bet you we're going to have more riots in minnesota and minneapolis mm -hmm. because these policemen are going to get off because the power line block the power line block mm -hmm. uh reported that the ma the manual from the Minneapolis to police department how do you restrain a intoxicated man will you put your ne knee on his neck well that just in that, other words this the, is a, the the whole rest uh, may look horrible to on film but it was by the book so the problem is this guy has been charged with first degree murder and his defense is the guy was going to die anyway of of uh Overdose. of uh fentanyl, fentanyl. fentanyl. Yeah. and the way he was subduing him was entirely according to the training manual of the minneapolis police department the the problem is and here's the greatest example minnesota has two tapes there's the four minute tape where you see the officer kneeling on uh, um, the suspect's neck and the suspect says i can't breathe there's the eight minute video where he says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe when he's in the back of the car, before he's being arrested, when he's walking around, when they're trying to subdue him, he could not breathe because he was overdosing on fentanyl. One of the things fentanyl does is fill your lungs with fluid. And he was dying of uh, liquid uh, asphyxiation. And it's sad, it's horrible, uh, it's a horrible drug. It's what took out uh, Prince, uh, you know, uh, the famous singer and it, it's rampant in minnesota and minneapolis but we judged a four minute moment in time when it was something that took over an hour and a half you know for the time he would the police were called uh to a, a person trying to pass off bad checks to this this whole type of situation it's a sad horrible situation but when you just look at a fraction of what happened on videotape and you try and judge it you're going to burn down your city that happened in Minneapolis, that happened in Kenosha, that happened in D.C. Rochester is going to uh, burn this weekend for sure. Um, Chicago, I, Madison, Wisconsin, where nobody got arrested. <laughs> Nobody's been arrested. But just because they're liberal enough to uh, to, to to feel your pain, they, they burnt down the center of the city. So mm. it's, uh, it's a difficult time, but, I, um, but it's just so funny in that... Uh, none of that's happening in florida it's happening in very tiny pockets in uh tampa and uh, orlando and miami and jacksonville but they don't go more than 15 20 minutes before the police arrive mm -hmm. and shut it down and no one is getting killed no one is uh losing their properties or businesses the and we don't have more police per capita than they do up north it's just that the approach taken by the state and local authorities has uh been successful so far in minimizing death and property damage the, the way they shut down the riots in kenosha was to pull over all the out-of-state cars when they were coming into town and that largely shut down the the protest the street burnings and i would suggest that for future riots um, well, we can't do that in Florida. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're all they're all out of state. And, and Kevin, you'll get stopped every time you cross the state line. <laughs> Indeed. All right, guys. That's today's program. There's three or four people out there who say, "You guys, you're just you, you can't stick to the topic. You go down rabbit trails." And I just want to say that is the very definition of unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 617 of Anglican Unscripted.